ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه وازواجه ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون اما بعد brothers and sisters in islam after praising allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking allah to exalt the mention and grant peace to the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam i first and foremost would like to thank you very very much for having uh, hosted uh, myself uh, in this particular country um, and in this particular event uh, alhamdulillah I give you the good news and the glad tidings that thus far everything is good uh, the brothers Allah khair, are very hospitable very kind very courteous and very considerate and so everything is in order by Allah's grace and mercy um, in regards to the workshop um, the workshop is a very funky one um, and, and of course the term funky can be defined in many different ways you have to accept the, the acceptable one and the good one funky as in it has a lot of a lot of issues that should and could be addressed um, and we will try to address all of them in a very practical way uh, because one of the problems that one faces in da'wah is the difference between theoretical and practical da'wah uh, in theory we can speak for hours and so can everybody else but when it comes to the actual practicality of it and implementation many people fail to successfully do da'wah the, the phone, uh, the, the pad is loud sorry by the way, and this will actually be a part, part of the introduction one thing we have to keep in mind is that I'm very bad in a sense that anything distracts me Okay, small sounds or, 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 or sometimes movement will make me lose my focus and then lose my chain of thoughts and then in the process the, the da'wah will fail. So among the rules which we have to adhere to strictly is avoiding anything which is not necessary because there are things which are necessary. If, if someone you know, got in, in some urgency, you're expected to act accordingly. But if there's no urgency, focus. For instance, Human beings have the tendency to look at everyone who comes and goes. So I'll be speaking or anyone will be speaking, someone opens the door and everybody is looking at the person who came in, they check out what he's wearing, they check out his shoes, if he's wearing shoes, they check out his toes if he's not wearing shoes, and they do an analysis of the person while the speaker is speaking. And so if 10 people walk in, you lost a lot. And you don't know where the benefit is, not for myself, not for you. So f f concentration is necessary. Avoid any kind of distraction. Your phone, um, there's something called RBDM. Uh, RBDM. Does anyone know what that is? RBDM. What do we call in English? When you have a bunch of letters which represent something, abbreviation, good. But there's a more technical term, acronym, acronym. Abbreviation usually, even though they use them interchangeably, is a long word cut short. Advertisement, ad. Acronym is when you get the first letter of, of each word in a title, and you make it a word like National Basketball Association NBA you see the difference between an acronym and an abbreviation so the acronym uh, RBDM is ring based donation methodology if your phone rings you will have to donate something okay we we'll still call it donation so inshallah if your knee is there you will get some ajr Otherwise, it could be tax, if you look at it in another way. So, any phone ringing, usually in the lectures, we tell them in the beginning, if your phone ring, we will confiscate it. 
then we will go to a particular area in, in Jeddah where they sell phones and we'll sell the phone, use the money for da'wah. So don't worry, you're losing, not all the way, but you're losing. For, if you want to keep your phone, keep it silent. If you want to keep your phone, keep it silent. Thirdly, we have ladies and or we will have more ladies and when ladies exist amongst uh, brothers, we have to have a whole different approach in behavior. Uh, people have the tendency when they, when a sister speaking to turn. We can't do that. So if a sister is speaking because we asked a question or she has a question and you hear a, a female sound, the shaitan and the natural, natural human tendency is that you want to see where the source of the sound is. If it's a brother, look all you want. If it's a sister, we can't look. Can be turning around seeing who is speaking. It's none of our business, even if it's your sister. Even if, even if you know it's your sister and you're looking at your sister, when other people see you look, they will look because you look. So when the ladies speak, it's none of our business. We hear the sound, her voice is not a awra. If she's speaking, if she's speaking moderately, her voice is not a awra according to the unanimous agreement of this college, you may say, because the Sahabiyat spoke at the time of the Prophet Aisha would answer questions when people ask. So this is already known. But we do not look at them uh, during their speech. Uh, another rule uh, is that of punctuality. Uh, being punctual is, is part and parcel of da'wah. In fact, one of the defects uh, that is found in the da'wah field among du'at and among the mad'uween, those who are being invited or the invitees, is that everybody is lax when it comes to uh, timing. And it is unbecoming. It is unbecoming and it is unacceptable. So when we say, for instance, there's a 15 minute break, no one says, brother, the Sri Lankan time is 30 minutes. Okay, because every country in the world have the same methodology. In every country they say, yeah, I know, but our time in Saudi, they say Saudi time one hour. In Lebanon, Lebanon time two hours. So they vary in the duration of delay. But that doesn't make it any sense. So 15 minutes means 15 minutes. Okay, if you, if you object to the 15 minutes, you want more time, we will present our case to the organizers. So the brother said 15 is not enough, we need 20, so we can push for more time. But if you agree to the time, then we have to stick to the time. Now, uh, in, the, in the process of, of this workshop, we will be dealing with PowerPoint presentations, and we will be dealing with different things, some videos here and there that I would like your feedback and your comments on. And there will be many times where you are involved. And I want you to be involved. This is not a lecture. It's impossible to deliver a lecture for eight hours. Uh, this is a, a more of a workshop. Well, it is a workshop. And the workshop requires the participation of the individuals who are part of this workshop. So get yourself ready mentally for uh, pitching in and helping me out and uh, giving answers. Uh, even if you think they're erroneous, it is a perfect time to correct any misunderstandings or misconceptions which you may have. Before I go into the first presentation, um, the, the first thing I would like to discuss with you, which I'm sure you probably know, is the virtues of da'wah. What is da'wah first linguistically? What is da'wah according to the definition of the scholars? And why do we have to give da'wah? Or do we have to give da'wah? Is it voluntary? Is it an obligation? Is it none of our business and what do you get when you are involved in this field all these issues deserve uh, some elaboration first and foremost the term in and of itself uh, you will learn as you move on in life or as you move on in your acquisition of knowledge that you will find in Islam every single word which you know in Islam has an original linguistic meaning Okay, because it's Arabic. Then that linguistic meaning was shifted from the language to the legislation. When it took on this legislation, understanding of it, an additional meaning, sometimes many meanings, sometimes conditions, sometimes uh, prefixes and suffixes, all of them are added to that word in its new meaning. So, salah. Salah originally has to do with dua only. Back then, salah, one of the meanings of salah was dua. And one of the meanings of salah was from sila, to connect. 
When salat started being used in Islam, it became, it be, it became, became beginning with uh, takbir and ending with salam or taslim. So you went through now, when you say salah, everybody thinks Fajr, Zuhur, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, Nawafil, uh, Qiyamul Layl, it's all called salah. Even though it still carries a linguistic meaning, now there's an additional legislative meaning to the word. Da'wa, da'a, yad'u is to call or to invite. To call or to invite. That is the linguistic meaning. So you say, uh, Fulan da'a Fulan ila wajbat al ta'am. Such and such person invited such and such person to a lunch a meal, to lunch. This is what da'wa means. In Islam, it means a lot more. Can someone quote an ayah where that term was used? Not necessarily in this form, any derivative of the word. Can anyone quote a single ayah from the Quran where you hear or read this word? There's no room for them? Yeah, operators. Operators. Oh, mashallah. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> yes. Not an ayah? Uh, That's English. I like English, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I want an Arabic ayah. May I? Yes, sir. <laughs> Sensational. Udru. <laughs> What kind of tense or what kind of yes? What do we call what do we call the command in English? I include grammar, by the way, in all the dawah because I'm an English language instructor. So this is you have to pardon me for that one. But hey, we can all use some English skills, right? Nowadays, you know, your salary can be doubled if your English skills are good, and if you make double salary, you can use that money for dawah. So it's still for dawah. What do we call that kind of sentence? We have. Declarative sentences, we have interrogative sentences, the sentences, exclamatory sentences, and imperative. Imperative is where there's a command. Come here, listen to me. Okay, it usually ends with a period. Exclamatory is when there's a, uh, there's a strong feeling associated with that. Watch out, wow, something like that. And then, of course, interrogative is when you ask a question. Declarative is just that, you know. Dogs are all over Sri Lanka. Drive them. I'm amazed, man. Three, four dogs, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What's going on here? They're all over the place. They sleep in the middle of the street. They anyway, so that's a declarative sentence. You're just sharing information with people. So where was I? Udru. So here it's an imperative. It's a command. Call or invite to the way of your Lord. Bil hikmah with wisdom. That's one of the ayat we were supposed to quote actually. With wisdom. What is wisdom? What is hikmah? Are you guys sleepy? It's nine o'clock. Come on, man. You're supposed to be in school now studying anyways. I, I guess I, I can tell how you act in school. Now the teacher just speaks to the walls. Come on, guys. Huh? Sunday? Oh, no school? Oh, I'm sorry. In Saudi Arabia, Sunday is a regular day. <laughs> Thursday and Friday are the weekends. Maybe you need to move over there. So what? Wisdom is intellect? No. Debatable. What is wisdom? Wisdom can't be learned. It can't be learned. It's it cannot be learned? Wisdom, wisdom can be attained through experience. Okay, so then it can be learned. I mean, Allah gives you wisdom. Because Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا يُؤْتَ الْحِكْمَةِ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا Whosoever has been given wisdom, so أُوْتِ is given by Allah. But then, it, with time, with experience, with application, you can actually grow that wisdom, not independent of Allah. Nothing happens without Allah's allowance and, uh, and uh, will. So even you, by following worldly reasons, you are able to gain experience and wisdom, but it's Allah who, gave, who made this format. It's the format of Allah with this creation, that when you do this, there's a reaction. You know, there's a reaction to the things you do, unless Allah was otherwise. Can someone give us an example where uh, natural occurrences did not occur, 
because of Allah's will. You know, when you do something, you're supposed to get a result of it. But if Allah willed otherwise, that doesn't happen. Who can give us an example? What normally happens, if Allah willed, does not happen anymore. If you put your finger in the fire, do you feel cold? What happens? Why? Fire burns. Allah created fire and gave it the ability to burn. See how you look at the guy? You got candy right now? Fitna man, this is fitna brother. They're gonna keep looking at it the whole time. I'm gonna hide this thing over here man. I know, I've, trust me, I've learned my lesson in the past. The last thing you want to do is bring food and juice during a lecture. Khalas, the mind's shut down. So when is he gonna finish? When is he gonna finish? When is he gonna finish? There's nothing there brothers right now. There's mentos but not, not for you, okay? Not yet at least. So uh, uh, when Ibrahim, when Ibrahim was thrown to, into the fire, did he burn? Why? Because Allah said what? قُلْنَا يَا نَارُ كُونِي بَرْدًا وَسَلَامًا عَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمٍ End of story, Allah said to the nar, to the fire, which burns, كُونِي be imperative, بَرْدًا cool, برد, cool, سَلَامًا from سَلَامًا peaceful, don't burn, neither be a source of heat, nor be a source of burning, عَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمٍ upon Ibrahim, and so they threw him into the fire, nothing happened to him. So that, that, the command of Allah made that which He usually made now a source of burning. Allah told him not to burn, it doesn't burn anymore. So wisdom, you, you follow the steps and if Allah wills, usually you, your wisdom is going to come. If Allah will that even with experience you don't get wisdom, you can't get it. No one can do things independent of Allah So wisdom as the scholars put it, don't worry about the birds. As the scholars put it is putting things in their right place. Yeah, Ani, let me just give you, there's a puzzle. Okay, let's say this is a puzzle. This is a puzzle. And you have, let's say everything has been put in place and there's only one piece left. Wisdom is not to put it in your pocket. Or not to throw it at someone. Or not to rip it into pieces. Wisdom is putting it where it belongs. When you put it where it belongs, that's wisdom. So you say what you're supposed to say to the right individual because you cannot say the same thing to every single person. And you cannot say the same thing in every situation. Who can give us an example from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, wherein he avoided doing something, Waalaikum Salam, he avoided doing something because of the environment. And it is not blameworthy. It is not compromising. It is not giving up on the truth. When or who can quote an incident in the life of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, wherein he wanted to do something and he deliberately left it alone because the situation was not one where that would be wise. Yes, not expanding the Kaaba, destroying the Kaaba. Now, he said to Aisha radiallahu anha in the hadith of Sahih, he said, had your people, had your people not been fresh from Kufr, had they not just left Kufur, I would have demolished the Kaaba and we built it according to the ways of Ibrahim. According to the, the construction of Ibrahim. But the people were, even the, the, the polytheists, the Kufar of Quraysh, they still magnified the Kaaba. They still would actually go around naked. Yes, they would go naked and dance and clap. They would clap and whistle. That was their ibadah around the Kaaba. With that, they still venerated the Kaaba. So the Prophet ﷺ, even though he wanted to rebuild it according to Ibrahim's original way, he said, the people are not ready. It would be too much of a fitna. The only thing that would register is, you're destroying the Kaaba, you are the messenger of Allah, and you know, you're supposed to venerate the Kaaba. You're demolishing the Kaaba because of that misunderstanding or even the potential of it, he didn't do it ﷺ. So then, wisdom means that you have to actually evaluate the scene and the theme and the audience and the many different things and speak accordingly. And you have to speak accordingly. This is hikmah. What does that mean? Huh? Have to work on these vocabularies. 
Mawrida. Translation, Mawrida. Anyone? There are at least at least three words. Moment? Mawrida. Uh, sisters, you have the freedom to... Don't look. Sisters, you may answer. If you have an answer, you may answer. Advice is nasiha. Mawrida. For example, in Umar ibn al-Bashir radiallahu said, وَعَظَنَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ مَوْعِظَةً بَلِيغَةً زَرَفَتْ مِنْهَا الْعُيُونُ وَوَجِلَتْ مِنْهَا الْقُلُوبُ كُنَّا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ كَأَنَّا أُصِيَتُمْ دَيْلَ آخِرِ الْحَدِيثِ No. When someone... No. When some... No. نصيحة. Well, it's a form of نصيحة. It is, no doubt, but... You guys are ladies more more particular. You have to be more more particular. Yes, admonishment. To exhort. Exhortation, they call exhortation. And they you write these down, please. Even if you think you'll memorize them, don't think that you will. Usually you will forget 80% of what you hear. Unless you write it down and you review it later. So mawida and it's meme wow ain tamarbuta is admonishment or exhortation, which means to speak to the people or to address the people with the intent of changing their heart. Not, not empty speech, a speech wherein the audience is affected. Effective speech. Say things which reminds them of Allah, makes them want to do tawbah, repent to Allah, makes them want to increase their iman or increase their iman. This is mawridah. Because there's a difference between kalam, just speech, and mawaidah, which is kalam with an effect, with an effect on the people listening. Um, well, mawaidah al-hasana, then hasana obviously is excellent. It's not really good, they say good. But then good could be used, but, but usually, usually in school, if you went home with the grades good, with good grades, as in your average was good, is that good? No! Not to your parents. When will they be happy? When they see what? Excellent. When they see excellent, then that's excellent. When they see good, yeah, it's good as in it's not bad, but it is not really, not very good, not excellent. Because you have good, very good, excellent. So ihsan or hasana is not really just good, because that term may be misinterpreted. It is, it is the, the, the epitome of goodness, which is excellence. So with excellent preaching or exhortation, preaching, we said admonishment, preaching, preaching is a term that creates a conflict when it comes to other religions because it has its own uh, connotations in other religions. But that's not the discussion right now. So then you have to do so in the best manner. How is that? From the heart. You may have been given a gift. Some people are gifted in the term, the way they speak. Some people are not. But they are, but that doesn't mean that they cannot be effective. It is not about the ability, because people can speak and mislead you. In fact, most, most of that which creates deviance is done by people that are very much good in speaking. That's why they're able to attract the people away from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So the, this being a good speaker doesn't really cut it. It is being a good speaker with the speech being sound and authentic. But what is important is the exhortation that it comes from the heart. When it comes from the heart, even if you're not, even if you're the worst speaker in the world, it will still be effective inshallah. If you're sitting with someone and you advise them from the heart to the heart, then you have done your job. But if you're a public speaker, you have a lot more to do. You have to train yourself to speak publicly, you have to, you have to grow your skills, you, and that only happens with experience and with application. Some people think, I'm going to wait till I'm 50 years old, then I'm going to go do it. It doesn't happen overnight. It's something that you have to gradually work on, and it comes with time. So, وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي أَحْسَنَ And argue with them in a way which is best. So you find the ulama usually say, you will notice that whenever Allah enumerates things in an ayah, that he begins in order of importance. The asr, there are exceptions to the rule, but the fundamental principle, things are addressed in order of importance. So the most important thing, 
or the priorities are mentioned first and then those which come after. There are exceptions to the rule, just so you will not bring me an ayah say, but Allah said here, so we understand. Generally speaking, so that means that the, the, these are the three levels of da'wah, the scholars say. Hikmah, which is done with people that are already receptive, people already ready, they want it. So these ones, you don't have to go into all kinds of, you, know, you just give them the call Allah, call Rasul alayhi salatu salam, khalas. So now the hikmah is just saying the right thing to this individual, you've done the job. If there's some sort of resistance, you move on from hikmah to mawridha hasana. Then you have to add things which may scare the person. Yani a sister just got guided. She wants the hijab. In fact, she wants the hijab and her parents don't. She is fighting with her parents to put on the hijab. She is ready. You just said Allah said like this in Surah Al-Nur or in Surah Al-Mu'min Ahzab, khalas, she's done. But some sisters are not ready. Then you have to use the mawr the hasana, sister, fear Allah. There's Jahannam for the lady who does this. Allah promised this, you know, as a punishment. Then you have to do an exhortation, targheeb and tarheeb. Targheeb is encouraging, tarheeb is scaring them, frightening them. So be careful of the punishment of Allah. And remember the ajr of Allah. This is mawr the hasana, the second level. That if the, pre the person is neither receptive, nor has some resistance, they're one of these adamant people on deviance, then you have to use the third one, you argue. But when you argue with them, you argue with them in a manner which is best. Meaning do not go to levels that are not becoming. Because you will find that whenever the people who are not upon the sunnah want to conflict the people's sunnah, they use the worst language in the world. They start using bad language and things which, which a Muslim wouldn't say. Now there are some words, adjectives which may be used, but sometimes they go into things that are very filthy. And so this is not, this is not jidal billati ahsan. And jidal also billati ahsan means that you don't argue on a pointless matter. Or you don't continue arguing when you know that it's, it's like you're beating a dead horse. You know it's already done? Did anyone invite these birds? You stay away from here, view Sonic. The lecture is not about birds. So you use the third category, that you don't go on and on, or it's, it's a fruitless, they don't want to accept it, then there are, there are times to withdraw. It doesn't mean you stop giving da'wah. But at that particular time, at that particular moment, until the situation changes, until you see there's a reason for them to hear you, you have to back off. Because if you don't, it will create a bigger fitna. It will create a bigger problem, and we are, the Amr bin Ma'roof and Al-Munkar is enjoining good forbidding evil. That's why Ibn Qayyim al jawzi rahimahullah, and other among the ulama say, if forbidding the evil is going to create bigger evil, it becomes haram to forbid the evil. If forbidding an evil is going to create a greater evil, it's haram. Because what, why were you forbidding the evil? To stop evil. If you created bigger evil, did you, did, uh, did you get the objective? Did you accomplish anything? No, you made it worse. So you don't do it. Yes, an example would be, you go to, uh, you go to a masjid and you find that uh, people, for example, pray a particular way. Or you find that they have some sort of air in, in the way they pray. And you know they are the kind of people that if you were to tell them something, they would beat you up. Okay? Or they would go and attack the masjid which you belong to. And so if you trying to do something is going to get other people in trouble, including yourself, then, then you don't get into that. Not that you approve of falsehood, but now da'wah entails that you have to evaluate the situation and avoid that which will create a bigger evil. If you're able to stop it without any bigger evil being created, you must do so. Because if you see an evil, you have to change it with your hand or with your mouth. And if both fail, as in terms of imp the most important thing is with your hand, then with your mouth, then with your heart. But that is the weakest of Iman. However, sometimes it is not because it's the weakest of Iman, because you're only trying to avoid the greater evil. Many examples can be given uh, to this, and maybe we can have some of you give us some other examples as well, eventually. So that is the whole idea of this ayah. So this ayah actually is one of the most quoted ayat when it comes to the virtues of da'wah or the methodology of da'wah. Uh, now, how about the virtues of da'wah? Can anyone give us an ayah or a hadith? But let's begin with the Qur'an. And when we say begin with the Qur'an, 
Does that mean that we, in order of importance we have Quran, then Sunnah, then, then scholars? Is that correct? In order of importance, Quran, then Sunnah, then the statement of the scholars. Is this correct? Wrong. This is incorrect. We have Quran and Sunnah. Not Quran and Sunnah. Quran and Sunnah, then the statements of the Sahaba in regards to the Quran and the Sunnah, then the statement of the Tabi'een in regards to the statements of the Sahaba and the Quran and the Sunnah, and going down. Don't, don't think there's Quran, Sunnah. Yeah, well, these are different issues right now. What is important, but when you say ijma and qiyas, ijma is consensus, it's not, not an issue here. Qiyas is, is still from the Quran and the Sunnah, because we have evidences for it from the Quran and the Sunnah. So you still, even qiyas, you still have in Quran and Sunnah. But they are equally important. Except that Sunnah requires a form of verification and authentication not found in the Quran. Because the Quran is mutawatir. It has been narrated by so many individuals over such a long period of time that it is impossible that all of them conspired to fabricate this Quran. However, the hadith, Allah decreed by His wisdom that it doesn't have the same application. But it is still a revelation from Allah. Because Allah said in Surah Al-Najm, مَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ he does not speak. Listen now, you have to, when you read an ayah in the Quran, you can't just be nonchalant or casually read it. No, no, you have to understand what Allah is saying. وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ He does not speak of his own hawa, desires. In, it is nothing except huwa, that Quran or that hadith, wahyun yuha, the speech of the Messenger of Allah is a revelation being revealed. Look at the word, wahyun yuha, it's being repeated. The term is being repeated just for emphasis. Allah is emphasizing. So it is a revelation from Allah. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in regards to the deen is a revelation from Allah. It explains the Quran. So it is equally important. Quran and Sunnah, and then we have everybody and everything else. So who can quote an ayah? But the reason why I said ayah in the beginning, just so that we can have a system to follow. If you want to quote a hadith, that's fine. Who can quote an ayah or a hadith about the virtues of da'wah? Continue. Continue. Good. Does anyone else know this ayah? Only two brothers? Surah Fussilat. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَنِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Now, the, the format, the, uh, the linguistic composition of this sentence is amazing. In and of itself is a miracle. Because the Quran, the speech of Allah is miraculous. This, the ulama say it is uh, istifham taqriri. Can anyone try to analyze that? Istifham taqriri. What does that mean? Istifham. Have, yes, istifham from interrogative. Jumla istifhamiya, interrogative sentence where you ask a question. How are you? That's an interrogative sentence. What time is it? It's an interrogative sentence. Taqriri, it's a form of a, a, a form of approving or a, for, a form of confirmation. So the sentence is a question that is intended to prove the point, not really ask a question. It's a rhetorical question. Very important. I'll give you an example. Um, someone comes late to the workshop. And I say to this person, you have come late, haven't you? Now am I really asking? Don't I already know that he came late? So what is the intent behind that? I'm, prove, I'm trying to prove he came late and I'm reprimanding him for coming late. So now whatever the reason is, the intention is no longer to ask a question. Because he cannot tell me, no I'm not late. Because we all know that you're late. You understand? So he knows, I know that he came late. 
But I don't want to tell him, uh, you're late. I want to say, you know, you have come late, haven't you? So I have a niya behind the question. In this particular form, there is a niya. There's an intent behind this, the, the question, which is not to ask, but to establish. Allah is saying, who is better in speech? The ulama say, meaning, لَيْسَ هُنَالِكَ لَيْسَ هُنَالِكَ أَحَدْ كَلَامُهُ أَفْضَلْ مِنْ الدَّعْوَةِ There isn't anyone whose speech is better than he who calls to Allah. So even though the translation is, and who is better in speech than he who calls to Allah, or he who invites to Allah, and he does righteous deeds, and he says, I am among the Muslims. Even though it is being said as a question, what, is Allah, what Allah is really saying, there's no one better in speech than the one who invites to Allah. So among all the things we say all day, and we talk a lot, we talk a lot, the best speech which you can ever make is the one wherein you are inviting people to Islam and to Allah. Be it Muslims or non-Muslims, it doesn't matter. It's not restricted to da'wah as in giving a public lecture or a workshop. Some people think that da'wah is restricted to that. This is incorrect. Da'wah could be with your own sister, with your mother, with your father, with your, the treatment that you have towards others. Anything with the niyyah of bringing people closer to Islam, Muslims and non-Muslims, this falls under the general understanding of da'wah. And Allah is saying, there is no one better in speech than he who calls to Allah, and he does righteous deeds, and that indicates that it is not enough to speak if there is no application. Because many people speak, they can talk a lot, but there is nothing to back it up. So not only that you are inviting people to goodness, you have to be upon goodness yourself. So Allah says, not only he صالحاً, he himself does righteousness. And then he declares at the end proudly that I am among the Muslims. Which, yani this ayah, you can go on for days with the ulama about this one ayah. Yani the indication of the humbleness of the da'i. He is not saying that I'm the leader of the Muslims. In the Nimin al Muslimin, I'm one of them. You see these Muslims, I'm only one of them. I'm only a member of the community. So that is, so that will put the. One more time. That will put the da'i in, keep him in check. Keep him in check. Because people sometimes believe themselves too much. And very often it's because of the people. That's why if you really want to help your brother who gives da'wah, do not overpraise him. Do not overpraise him. You're not helping him. Don't tell him, oh brother, blah, blah, blah. Nope. The sunnah is that you just don't break his back. And the, the sunnah is that you throw dust in the person's face who praises you in your face. No. Nah. Don't say anything. You really like what he's doing, make dua for him. Or you may say some things of encouragement, Jazakallah khair, something like that. But to go and give a long introduction about this, this and that, it actually does not help the da'i get closer to Allah. He starts, you know, having self-conceited uh, understanding. He starts praising himself, himself. He has ujub, self-admiration. And once you reach that point, psh, the da'wah is done. He's destroyed. The people may go to Jannah and he will go to Jannah. And that's the last thing you want to do, that, beats, that, that defeats the purpose of da'wah. So it is a sunnah not to praise a person in his face. And not to say things which make them think that they are very special when they are not. Even if you think that they are. Everybody knows the shortcomings with Allah. So this is the ayah which can, uh, which can be quoted in this regard. Can someone quote a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ even in English about the virtues of da'wah? Yes, Brother Adam. Go back. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, we said in Arabic, so I'm probably not the only one here who doesn't understand Arabic. Can we get a translation whenever it is read? Yeah, I translated it. Well, and who is better in speech than he who calls to Allah, does righteousness, and says, among, I'm among the Muslims? I probably translated it uh, over a, a long span of the. I inserted my speech. Okay. Okay, so the, the translation of the ad, because I, he's right, I inserted my, my speech in the middle of the translation so you no longer know what is translated and what is my own words. Zakallah khair. The ayah is, and who is better in speech than he who calls to Allah, does righteousness and says, I'm among, I am among the Muslims. That is the translation of that particular ayah in Surah Fusira. A hadith. A hadith, ya jamaat al khair. 
Leave that aside. Good one, but not, but not now. Not a hadith? We need to have 12 workshops, man. Do you have time? Hadith, one hadith about da'wah. One, one. Half a hadith, yes, sheikh. I'll complete the other half. Yes. خلاص, he gave me half. I'll give you the other half. من دعا إلى هدى كان له من الأجر مثل أجور من تبعه لا ينقص ذلك من أجورهم شيئا Whosoever he invites people to guidance not إلى الهدى to a particular form of guidance إلى هدى بدون المنكر نكرة نكرة مش منكر عفوا نكرة it is doesn't have the definite article the to a guidance, meaning anything which is a form of guidance, any form of guidance in Islam, shall have a reward equivalent to the one, all those who follow him, without their reward being diminished the least bit. Very important explanation, because one usually has the idea that when you share something with someone, you go 50-50, right? Meaning if, if someone follows you, and you will get the same thing, you will get what he gets, means he has to give one half to you. I'll tell him, for example, look, sell this phone for me, and you make a hundred riyals, I'm sorry, hundred rupees, and you take fifty, you give me fifty, so we can both win. He's the one doing the sale, he didn't have the phone, he made fifty rupees out of me, and I made fifty rupees because it's my phone, I deserve a profit. That is the general condition. But the hadith states, that all those who follow the one calling to guidance, he will have a reward equivalent to theirs, but they won't be sharing 50 with him. They will have the full reward, and he or she will have the full reward. That's beautiful. Yeah, and if someone gave, someone guided you some guidance, and this person got 10 million good deeds, because of one hadith or one ayah this da'i, or this shaykh or this alim quoted, the person will get the 10 million good deeds just like the one who got it because of him. So you have 10 million, he has 10 million. You're not going 50-50 on it. And, and this hadith by itself is, what else do you want? Look, what else do you want? If you invite the people to Islam or Muslims to Islam and they listen to you and they start applying, if you have a crowd of 50 people and all of them start applying what you have said, how many good deeds are you going to have if Allah accepts? More than you can ever get by praying all night. That's why the ulama say that the, there's two kinds of benefit in Islam. Naf'un qasir wa naf'un muta'addin. A restricted form of benefit and an expandable form of benefit. The restricted one is when you pray qiyam. 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, you stand and you pray. Jazakallah khairan, fantastic. No one's going to tell you sleep. If you can pray all night, pray. If you can pray a third, pray. If you can pray half, pray. Get closer to Allah. But what is superior to that, is that which not only benefits you, but benefits the people around you. That, both are good. But the other one, which includes others, is superior which, which, to the one which is restricted to the doer. That's why, because of the ajr associated with that. You can get the full ajr for Qiyamul Layl, but if other people start doing good things because of you, then you're getting way more ajr in this sense. Even though the whole thing revolves around Qabul, Allah accepting your deeds or not. So that is one hadith which we can record. How about the hadith of Ali radiallahu anhu? When he sent Ali somewhere and he told him something, what did he tell him? Yes, sir. لَأَنْ يَهْدِيَ اللَّهُ بِكَ رَجُلًا وَاحِدًا خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنْ حُمُرِ النَّعْمِ If Allah were to guide a single person, single man through you, it is better for you than the red camels. You may say red camels. What am I going to do with a red camel? Until now, until this day, in Dubai, in different places, they have camel competitions, and you will find a camel that is equal to 10 Ferraris. Until now, it's sold for price. You will look at it and say, it's just a camel. 
I mean, camels are great. Still, there's a miracle in it. But you will say, but the Lamborghini seems a little more practical nowadays. I can go 80, you know, 100 kilometers per hour. The camel is going to be slow. I may ride on it, fall on the other side. You have some issues. But the, the actual camel maintains its value. And if you don't believe that, let us say that a red camel is the most valuable asset the Arabs had back then. Today, what is the most valuable asset? You people say gold, a fancy car, a house, a, a castle, then all of that. Yes, whatever it is that people value today, one person becoming a Muslim is better for you than the most thing, the things you value the most. In another wording of the hadith, it's better for you than the earth and whatever's upon it. The whole world and whatever's in it, one person becoming a Muslim is better for you. So, so we learn from this that da'wah is very important and it is not restricted to public speakers. Even though they do the most, but you have a role to play. Everybody has to do da'wah according to what? According to your ability. What is the evidence? What is the evidence that you, you cannot be expected to do more than you can? And what is the evidence that you don't go into things which are not of your field? You have two ayat I need you to call. Two. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا Allah does not burden a soul beyond its scope. You all know the ayat, the end of Surah Al-Baqarah. Whatever is beyond your ability, it's not, you're not expected. So you give da'wah according to your ability. This is in terms of ability. Meaning there are things which you wish to do, but you can't. No problem. What about knowing your limits? You have to know your limits. I thought this was my car. Same alarm. So it's an old Echo. Don't think I have, you know, Mercedes. Just because it has an alarm, it doesn't mean it's a fancy car. So, which ayah speaks about, hey, don't go, don't go chasing after things that, that don't concern you. Remind me after the break to, to turn off this screensaver thingy, okay? Come on, guys. I'm going to fall asleep now. I'm going to fall asleep. I haven't had any sleep in two days. Well, I had some sleep, but not real sleep. So don't make it worse. You don't know one ayah which tells you, sisters, please answer. Usually, by the way, from my humble experience, the ladies usually have all the answers, but they're too shy. Everywhere I've gone, mashallah, tabarakallah, the ladies have it ready. But some of them are shy, so they don't express it. Otherwise, I'm sure some sisters might have some answers back there. But about you, brothers? One ayah that tells you, just know your limits. So I have to say it to you. وَلَا تَقْفُ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمُ سُورَةِ سُورَةِ الْإِسْرَاءِ إِنَّ السَّمَعَ وَالْبَصَرَ وَالْفُؤَادَ كُلُّ أُولَائِكَ كَانَ عَنْهُ مَسْؤُولَ Don't go chasing after that which you have no knowledge of. This explicitly Allah says. Don't go fetching after this which you don't know about. Verily the hearing in the sam wal basar and the sight and the heart, all of these you'll be questioned about. So from this ayah we learn that if you know ABC, you give da'wah to ABC. Don't go with the YZ. Yes, don't go. I mean, there are many different translations. But one of them is do not go chasing that which you have no knowledge of. In the sam'a veli, the hearing, the sight, and the heart, all of these you will be questioned about. Surah Al-Isra, I don't remember which ayah. I don't remember which ayah. Alrighty? Yes, sir. Is it a prerequisite that you have to be acting upon whatever you're talking about? Yes and no. Yes and no. Yes, because Allah said, Ya ayyuha ladhina amanu, lima taquluna ma la tafa'loon, kabura maqtan inda Allahi an taquluu ma la tafa'loon. Oh, you have believed, why do you say that which you do not do? It is highly detestable to Allah that you say that which you do not do. And another ayah, أَتَعْمُرُونَ النَّاسَ بِالْبِرِّ وَتَنْسَوْنَ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ تَتْرُونَ الْكِتَابِ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ 
want to declare the kitab. Do you enjoy upon people goodness and you forget about your own selves? Why you recite the book? Do you not understand? Do you not reason? Because of these ayat and other hadith, the, the, you, the general principle is that you have to act upon what you're talking about. However, the scholars have made further study of this matter and came up with further conclusions. Which is, basically, in a nutshell, yes, this is the case, but not all the time. Meaning, there may be areas, for example, let's say that you are a kind of person whose lifestyle does not allow you to pray Qiyamul Layl. Exactly Do you then stop telling the people to pray Qiyamul Layl? No, you don't. You understand what I'm saying? Because you may be in a situation, the, the, the fine line is negligence. Meaning, what, what Allah does not want us to do, is don't tell the people, don't do this, and then you go do it while you don't care. Otherwise, it's impossible. Because you can tell the people, lower your gaze, lower your gaze, don't look at women. Are you able to never look at women? You may fall into that trap, which you told the people not to do. So unless you become an angel, if you're going to tell the people, Allah said, the messenger said, if everybody was to apply Islam, then, and you were to act upon every single thing, you become a malak. Which is impossible. So you may fall into that which you told the people not to do. However, what is the element here? Your intent. You feel bad, you feel guilty. Say, talk to yourself, how can I told the people not to do it, how can I do it? There must be some remorse. What is not okay is tell the people, don't look at women, and then all day you are ah, having a good time. Don't look at women, I'm telling you. Brother, you're looking at women right now. Oh yeah, but that's me. I'm a da'i, you're not. So I can tell you that this is where the problem is. But doing that what you told the people not to do because of weakness, because the shaitan defeated you at that particular time, everybody falls there. There's no escape to that particular rule. So how did you get here? What was I saying? Yeah, I know, before the question. Huh? Yes, now, so this is where you know you limit. Don't go up. So if you know ABC, you give da'wah. So ABC, don't speak about other alphabet if you don't know them. And so now, now here's the question. Can anyone be a Muslim if he doesn't know Tawheed? Can you be a Muslim if you don't know Tawheed? Is that possible? <laughs> Which means that every one of us is supposed to be doing what? Giving da'wah to Tawheed. Because that is the minimum requirement for you to become a Muslim. If you say, brother, but I can't explain Tawheed, then I can say, brother, that you don't know Tawheed. And if you don't know Tawheed, then we have to question your Islam. Because that is a basic fundamental thing that every Muslim must know. So here is a very fine line here. If you, can, if you know Tawheed, if you're a Muslim, you must know Tawheed. If you know Tawheed, that's, that's one of the things that you should be able to convey to others. Which means each and every one of us is supposed to be a die. In this sense. Not everyone is supposed to be a public speaker, but everyone is supposed to be a da'i to Tawheed. Around the clock, anywhere you go. Now, that is the general principle. You may be able to explain Tawheed logically, because you logically believe in it. But you believe in it logically for two reasons. Because Allah is the one who made logic in it, and because Allah guided you to that logic. Because if Allah wishes to mislead someone because of their deviance, what is logical becomes to them illogical. So in all, uh, again, we go back to Allah's hidayah. No one should think that anything is independent of Allah's hidayah. It's in Allah's control from the beginning to the end. But the idea is, now that you know Tawheed, you could learn the supporting evidences. You have to now learn, if you want to be effective in your da'wah to Tawheed, you can learn the ayat which are quoted, the hadith which are quoted in favor of Tawheed. That is now enhancement of da'wah. But don't say, brother, I don't have any ayah memorized. I don't have any hadith memorized. Subsequently, I'm not supposed to give that to hate. Say that's incorrect. Because you still have, in your understanding that Allah gave you, the idea that only Allah deserves to be worshipped. At least, at least let us speak of Tawheed al-Uluhiyya. Tawheed al-Uluhiyya. Because the Sma'an Sifat is, is, is somewhat more complex. But the Tawheed al-Uluhiyya, meaning Allah is the only one deserving of worship, no one else. Come on. Allah is the Creator. The only creator, and because he's the only creator, do you worship other than the only creator? No, that's all you need. Really, that's all you need. Now, if you can quote an ayat 
to to prove that Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair and you've, you've added. But everyone is supposed to know the minimum requirement. Each and every one of us is supposed to know the minimum requirement. Right. So this ayah speaks about the limitations. So we quoted some ayat, we quoted some hadith, and of course there are many lectures on on the topic which you can listen to. So I'm not going to use up the whole time available uh, for that. But I think that is in, uh, uh, inshallah sufficient for the one who has been lazy or been holding back to start changing his views and start really taking this matter way more seriously because that's your ticket to paradise. That is your journey of peace and salah to prayer. That's the way you enter Jannah. By you being a sincere Muslim and, and making this the way of everybody around you. Making sure that everybody around you shares these views and values with you. That as a community, that's how we will prosper. As an ummah, that's how we will succeed. And as an individual, that's how you make it a Jannah. If we miss these elements, then we will miss out. And the, the, one of the benefits of da'wah, and let me just deal with this from a practical point of view, one of the benefits of da'wah is that it prevents you from a lot of evil which you otherwise would have fallen into. Trust me. Yani when you become someone who gives da'wah, even if no one sees you but Allah, you will come to situations where you want to do something, and then you, you will say to yourself, but I'm a person of da'wah. This is not befitting. You leave it alone. No one told you, no one reminded you, except that you see, you remember, I'm telling the people not to do this. How can I do it myself? And this is, if we all had this consciousness, we would be avoiding many sins. But the problem is, we don't have this consciousness, and so when we are alone behind closed doors, no one can see me. Yalla, I'll do whatever I want. No one sees. We know Allah sees, but Iman is not strong enough to stop us. It is not strong enough. Otherwise, if the Iman was sound, the fact that Allah sees us and the angels are writing down, khalas. We will stop. But we don't have that. Sadly, we don't have that level. But the, the da'wah will remind you. Say, hey, you know, you're someone who's supposed to be representing Islam. How could you do this? This is not befitting that you do this. So you wind up leaving alone a lot of sins. A lot of sins because of that, the da'wah which you are involved in. Right. Now, before we go in, or I, should I go in? Let me just open the, the whatchamacallit here. Let's hope this works. Yes. Now, of course, this workshop, by the way, is not something new. This workshop has been going on for some time in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, where my sorry self and the director of the Dawah Center uh, deliver or facilitate, we're called facilitators, of this workshop. Um, and we've had many participants, alhamdulillah, and so far, so good. Uh, so we had called it eight by four. Because usually you have four by four, right? You know the cars, four by four, four wheel drive, get on the mountain. Down. So where do we go beyond four by four? We're eight by four, you know, just doing it all the way. And the reason why we call it eight by four is because it was 32 hours. Eight sessions, four hours, so the total was 32. But that doesn't concern us. Now, what concerns us is of course, English for da'wah purposes, language sensitivity session. Very, very, very important. Language. Why language? Who can tell me, why do you think language is important in da'wah? And of course, we're not speaking about Arabic. Because now this is not the context of Arabs or Arabic. For now this is separate. We're speaking foreign languages. Language is foreign to Arabic. Why is language important in your da'wah? Why? Okay. You can be misunderstood. Why? Like what? What is it that you say that may be misunderstood because of language? Okay, well that's Arabic. I mean something else. Okay, fine, that's fine. But I mean something else. Context. We probably want to use the word connotation. Some words have multiple connotations, and you will see in the presentation that the word actually carries many different meanings. And you may want to use it with one meaning, but the person does not know that meaning which you know, 
he knows another meaning. So the word which you use in his mind is not what you intend. You know, there's a thesaurus. In the dictionary, you find that words have synonyms. So not everybody knows every synonym of every word. You may know a word, and, and you know that one of the meanings of this word is this, but the one you're speaking to does not know the meaning which you know, he knows that other meaning. So that one word you use may create a conflict in his mind. The reason why, because language is the means of transportation from point A to point B. Point A is you the die. Point B is the one you are inviting. The only way you can go to him or to her is through the vehicle of language. You're not going to speak sign language. You may, but that's uncommon. We're speaking generally. Okay? If you write, you're using language. If you speak, you're using language. So you, you cannot escape the issue of language. If there's, a, if there's a defect in the language, then there's a defect in what? The delivery. There's a defect in the transportation, the car breaks down, it takes longer, you take the wrong route, so you never make it there. You may crash into the person and kill him, or you may, you know, uh, uh, give him some, some sort of uh, de de uh, handicap, he becomes handicapped. You may create some damage because your car is not safe. Your car is not safe. You know, they don't drive good, or you don't have gas, or you st you're going too fast, whatever thing is, if there's a defect in your language, there's a defect in the da'wah. This is why it is of, of utmost importance that we actually uh, improve and enhance our language fi sabilillah. That's why I told you the English earlier. The English language now is the language of da'wah predominantly. Because it is international, unlike Tamili, unlike Sinhali, unlike Arabic, unlike French. Many different languages are usually restricted to a couple of countries, two, three countries, sometimes even part of a country. But English, you, you understand me, right? And if I were to go to India, would they understand me? Yes. And if I were to go to Pakistan, would they understand me? Yes. If you go to the States, Canada, Britain, Australia, Lebanon, Egypt, everywhere you go, to a large extent, people will understand English. So now English becomes one of these means of da'wah that we have to work on. If you, haven't, if you still have the same 54 words you learned in high school in your vocabulary list, then you're not doing the job. You must work on your vocabulary daily. And we have to learn what the words mean in the language we are using and what the, they mean in the, the, the religion of the speaker or the invitee. Meaning in our religion they have a meaning and in their religion they may have another meaning. You will see in the presentation a lot of that. So language sensitivity, please, yani, uh, this will only be the, the, um, the launch of this idea. The growth is on you. After I go back home, you know, you on your own have to work on your language skills because you cannot do everything now. But the idea is that this should in, incite you to understand the importance of language in da'wah so that you take the matter as, as seriously as it should be taken. The agenda would be a brief introductory remarks. We're done with that already. Uh, objective presentation, I already told you, so that you can grow your English language skills in the future. Uh, areas of language awareness, which we will be dealing with shortly, and practice exercise. You'll be helping me out a lot today. Uh, the objectives are to sensitize. Sensitize? What is sensitize? Sanitize? In the hospital now, they have it, you know, after the swine flu. Everywhere you go, you know, you get some, some of that uh, rubbing alcohol or whatever they call it. What is sensitize? From what word does it come? Yes, from being sensitive. It's the verb form of the adjective sensitive. So sensitive, you sensitize, meaning you create sensitivity. To sensitize participants, you have to have a form of sensi sensitivity to aspects of language related to the creed. You must know in our deen what these words mean for your own good. And to bring you to the awareness of the participants yourselves that the delicacy 
not the one you eat like, you know, caviar, from being delicate, the delicacy of language to facilitate delivering a clear message. You have to know that some words are very, they're so dangerous, it's not even funny. Wallahi, well, some words, yeah, and you can, can turn the da'wah upside down, can destroy the message completely. I will give you one famous word which people love, and I don't. You know, you know some of you know which one it is already. Okay? You're the boss. I'll put it on that corner. No problem. If something happens, you're reliable. Okay, I have nothing to do with it. Is that good? Zakallah khair. Well done. So we will be dealing with vocabulary, connotation, pronunciation and intonation, funny stuff. Real funny. If you haven't had a laugh in a while, get ready. Inshallah. And some of the expressions with the people, which the people use. Uh, in terms of vocabulary, let's deal first with Islamic terminology in English. And uh, I do, there are some books actually authored, but I have uh, found before uh, an Excel sheet, which I can email to you. I'll give you my email later, you can I'll email it to you, inshallah. I have it with me, I don't know what means you have to get it now, or later before we finish today. But I have with me already, and, and uh, you know what? Later, I'll show you later. An Excel sheet with Dawa terminology, okay? Arabic and English. Uh, I, if, if you can memorize it, that would be nice. I'm not going to examine you, nor will I give you a, a degree at the end, say, Dr. Um, you know, Ahmed in Islamic terminology. None of that stuff, but it will really help you a lot. So, you know, let's give some examples. Let's give some examples. Who can, who can give us some words? I will, I'll give you some Arabic words and you try to give me the English equivalent to see how good our vocabulary is in Islamic terminology. Fitra. What about the Zakatul Fitr? Because I've been, and I've heard some brothers use Fitra for zakat al fitr. You've heard that before? Say, I paid my fitra. I said, You paid your fitra? <laughs> but you can't be paying fitra, man. This is the natural way Allah created you. It's not something you can buy and sell. So, my brother, you know, I mean, you know, after Ramadan, and said, Oh, zakat al fitr. Yes, it's not fitra, Habibi. Fitra is natural inclination or natural disposition or the innate nature of many different words. Uh, how about the word, and that's a tough one, Ulu. Highness. Good. How, there's another English word, it's a little complicated, transcendence. Transcendence. How about the word, uh, Ulu. Ulu. Extremism. Good. How about uh, Israf? Extravagance. Extravagance. Well, you guys are doing good. Okay, so we won't waste time on that. But th this is what I mean. You have to know what the, when you hear a word, what the English equivalent is. That would help you in your salah. That would help you in taraweeh. If you know all these vocabularies and the Imam is reciting them, when you hear him speak and use these words, then you can relate to the topic at least. You can maybe feel what he's trying to say, as opposed to being totally, un, uh, you know, not knowing. Terminology, did I hear a phone ring? Hmm? That's outside. We can confiscate things outside or we can, maybe it's not a good idea. First visit, take it easy. Tayyip, uh, terminology pertinent to other religions. Who can give us some examples? Meaning in different religions, there are particular terms that have meanings. Should we be aware of them? Yes, we should. Yes, we should. So when you hear the name of different gods that the people have created, you should have a background on it so you know, okay, right, this is the object of worship of such and such religion. Sahih. When you hear, for example, Christianity, they use particular words. You know, when they use, for example, uh, um, the, the word, the word, the word, uh, what is the word? Redemption, atonement. 
What are these? What is atonement? What is uh, salvation? Confession. confession. When you hear confession, well, usually confession is that you, you, you know, you go to court and say, yes, your honor, I, I did the crime. I confess. But in Christianity, is that what it means? No. It means that you go to a priest and you tell him the things which you have done, you know, by yourself. Is that what we do in Islam? What are you supposed to do in Islam? Zip it. You commit sins? Shh. Seek Allah's forgiveness. You, because Allah is al sitir the one who loves to conceal, the concealer. Allah loves to conceal. When Allah conceals your fault, don't go publicize it. That doesn't mean that if you live the past life, which was non-Islamic, that you cannot share that with the people as means of admonishment. Because the Sahaba did. So the scholars make a distinction. They say if you live the bad past, and in mentioning that there's da'wah to the people, that's fine. What is not allowed is that you, uh, you, know, you do a sin, and you go and you brag in front of the people. Yeah, yesterday I did this, but Allah had conceded your fault. That is what is blameworthy. Yes, sir. The hadith says that Allah will not forgive the one who publicizes his sins. That's not what the hadith says. It says, Kullu ummati illa All of my ummah will be protected except those who publicize their sins. So what about those people who commit sins out in the open, in front of everyone? That they fall under that category, which, which is why it is very dangerous to sin publicly. That's why we all fall into sin. But when you fall into sin, you try your best to be not to do this in front of the people or publicly because you brought to yourself double trouble. The trouble of sin and the trouble of being in front of the people, you're careless about Allah, that's what it is. So I don't care, it's haram, it's haram, I want to do it anyways. It's a big problem and it's double trouble as you mentioned. Right. So confession is an example, salvation, atonement, things that related to other religions, you know what I'm saying. Knowledge of gen general vocabulary to enhance the quality of speech. There are some English words that really yani, save you the headache of having to give or write or uh, sentences. Sometimes one word, one English word, if you learn, it will save you the trouble of having to present to the people a whole sentence. For example, in Arabic, we have the word ithar. Have you heard ithar? Yu'thiruna ala anfusihim? Sahih? The, the Muhajirun, the, the Muhajirun and the Ansar. The Ansar used to give, they used to favor the Muhajirun even though they themselves were needy. So Allah said, Yu'thirun, Ithar. So now when we want to translate Ithar, you have to say, a person who is willing to favor another even though he himself needs that thing. Okay? That's a long sentence. Is there an English word that saves you the headache? There is. Probably don't know it. It's called altruism. And the, mo the person who does it is an altruist. Look it up online. Go to the dictionary, put altruist. A-L-T-R-U-I-S-T. And it will say someone who favors others over himself. So now instead of giving a long sentence, if we all learn the term altruism, mind you, if your audience were educated people, doctors and this and that, and they know the word, that is actually a bonus for you. Because there's a general idea that Muslims are uneducated, and then everybody else seems to be ahead. No, no, we say that we compete with you and everything. With the deen. With Islam on our side. So we, this is one of the reasons we don't want to be in a position of inferiority of being looked down upon or oh, I'm better than no you're not anything you bring we will challenge you and supersede you anything as long as it is halal as long as it's halal and as long as it benefits the da'wah anything we should be superior to all people on earth vocabulary is one of them so learning particular words will really save you a lot of headache Sahih. So that's one example which can be given. Another one, for example, we know that the Prophet ﷺ, oh, they say in Arabic, Utiya Jawamiul al Kalim. What does that mean? Meaning he's able to use very little words to express many profound meanings. Is there an English word for that sentence? Huh? Very 
Trinity? No, Trinity. 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 Uh, no. Close. Well, a good, good one. Being brief. But being brief, yes, who said? Concise. Concision. We say concision and precision. From concise and precise. Precise is to be very exact, very exact. And concise is to make things, you know, to be very, you know, uh, let's say economical in your usage of things. So the Prophet ﷺ had concision and precision in his speech. As opposed to, he used to say many different words, blah, blah, blah. Again, these are just some examples. The list goes on. Hey! First of all, infamous. What is infamous? The opposite of what? Famous. Here we have an issue of pronunciation. Some people may misread it and say, or mispronounce uh, it, say, infamous. And if you say infamous, no one will understand. They'll think that there's someone infamous, or famous is a city. Where are you? I'm infamous now. Okay, come back soon. No, brother, you know, infamous. Pronunciation here is, a, is not a joke. And we will give you other examples, like divorce and divorce. There's no such pronunciation of divorce, as in divorce. And usually what comes to mind is diverse, like a diverse community. So you may speak to people and you say, you know, there was a diverse thing and then the people may think you're speaking about diverse and they don't know you mean divorce. Just an example. There may be some, always there are some accents or some, some country, somewhere in the world which may have a very odd pronunciation, acceptable but not popular. You want to go to the standards. Because even in English language pronunciation, there are standards of acceptability. They call them standards of acceptability. Not that you have to sound American or British or Australian or whatever, but there are particular words which you have to pronounce a certain way, otherwise the, the listener may misunderstand what you're saying. It may take you off the track. So anyways, the infamous term, holy, holy. So what about holy? The holy prophet said that the holy Quran is the speech of Allah and that was revealed in holy Ramadan. Isn't that what you hear all the time? Is it correct? No. But brother, people hate it by the way. Brother, you kafir. I've had this all the time. Kafir's brother is a kafir man. He said, he said the Quran is not holy. Yes, yeah. I'm telling you all the time, read the Quran, man. How are you, you going to accuse me of kufr? He said the Prophet is not holy. Yes, I said he's not holy. Why? Because holy is a word which has many connotations. And in the English language, it is often used to mean divine. One of divine meaning godly qualities and traits. In Christianity, you have a holy father, a holy son, and a holy ghost or spirit. Which means what? It means God, God, God. And they tell you these three gods are one God. So now you're giving da'wah to a bunch of Christians and you tell them the holy prophet said in his mind, in his register, oh. So we have holy father, holy son, holy ghost, you have holy God and holy prophet. So now Muslims worship the prophet Muhammad wasallam, Or that he is equal to Allah. So why create this trouble for yourself when you don't really need it? Now, yes, you can mean by holy, as in chosen by God, or of, of, of you know, the, in that sense, yes, we agree. But that is not the most popular meaning that the people understand or do understand. So you will avoid terms of such connotations to avoid the fitna. Otherwise, as an adjective, the Quran is holy. Because it's a speech of Allah. And as an adjective, the Prophet is holy because he is chosen by Allah. Meaning there's a divine connection with his prophethood And the Ramadan is holy because it was legislated by Allah. You agree with me as an adjective. But when it comes to proper nouns, you fall into a whole other issue. When you start calling him all the give him a noun, you know, a proper noun, holy prophet, holy Quran. If you say holy prophet, 
And we don't have any evidence from the Sunnah or the Quran that he was called Al Nabiul Muqaddas because the, the word the equivalent to holy in Arabic is Muqaddas. Al Ard al Muqaddasa, the holy land. Al Qudus, the holy land. We don't have this in the Quran and Sunnah. So why are we Muslims calling the Prophet وسلم, holy when never ever in the Arabic language he was called holy? Number one. Number two, if that's going to make the people think that he is holy as in we worship him, then obviously you shouldn't use this term. And the same goes for Holy Quran. Where did we get the Holy Quran from? Time out. One last question before you run away. Where do we get the Holy Quran from? The term, the term. The term. Yeah, from Allah, I know that. Yeah, it's, it's, no, the term. The, why did Muslims start saying Holy Quran, Holy Quran? You weren't here before, huh? Where do you get it from? From who? Christian. Holy Bible? You can imagine how it came into existence. Oh yeah? Oh, you have Holy Bible? Well, here's the Holy Quran. That's, that's probably that's the mentality behind it. Oh yeah, well, you think we have to. So we actually borrow this term from them. Otherwise, we have Quran on Mubin, Quran on Hakim, Quran on Azim, Quran on Majid. But you will never find Quran on Muqaddas. Never, Ya Akhi, Allah never used it. So why do we want to use something which Allah never used? Glorious Quran, noble Quran, great Quran, clear Quran, wise Quran, whatever. But never ever holy Quran. So we avoid terms which have connotations in other religions that may create a conflict in their mind and misrepresent the da'wah which we intend on doing. There's a break right now which was imposed on us. For a good reason, actually, I have 10 minutes, uh, we, we started late. Yeah, we stop now. Yeah, yeah, there's, uh, there's, uh, we finished that slide. So we'll continue the next slide. So, but I, let's be punctual. How long is the break? It's 10, 10 now, according to my watch. 10, 10 minutes. 15 minutes. Okay, so if it's 10, 10 and 15 minutes, that means that what time will be here? 10.25. 10.25. <laughs> Anyone who comes late, it will be great. See what's going to happen.